speaker is Tony Gelsma. Okay, uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to give this talk. It may not be a surprise to anyone that there's been a dramatic increase in, in recent years um, of gender dysphoria or gender incongruence, as I'll talk about in, uh, in a little bit. What you can also see is the biggest increase is in adolescent females, and I will get back to that um, later on in my talk. Uh, but when you see this huge increase, you, you start wondering what's going on behind that. And there could be three possible uh, explanations for that. One is there could be genuinely an increased incidence um, of this condition, uh, and so this would be good that we can recognize it. Um, or sorry, that's bad because we got to figure out what's going on there. Uh, an increased recognition is, is probably a good thing, um, but there could also be a misdiagnosis. And that's what I'll probably look at. Uh, I will look at a little bit later on. Um, we need to start with some definitions. Um, biological sex is genetically and developmentally uh, programmed. Um, and so you've got the internal and external genitalia. Gender is really an internal sense of whether you're male or female. So we need to make that distinction. Um, I mentioned gender dysphoria and gender incongruence. It has in the past been called gender dysphoria, but the new DSM describes it as, as an incongruence between your gender and your sex. You can have the dysphoria if there is the distress that goes along with that incongruence. And, but I tend to flip between the two. Um, you also have an early onset where children early on um, say they are the opposite gender, um, but there's also the later onset that I showed the graph earlier, well, which begins in adolescence. Um, that, this implies a kind of a binary, but we also hear about people saying they are non-binary or they may be gender fluid and that gender is actually a spectrum. And depending on the situation, you could be more in one place than another. Um, that complicates things, um, and it's already a complicated field as it is. There have been three Christian approaches to gender incongruity, and it's uh, Mark Yarhouse and, and uh, Julia Kandus um, Sandusky who described this. There's the integrity approach, which said God's creational intent is binary, male and female, and any deviation from that is sin. The second uh, approach is the disability, and this is the one that I hold to. And, and I'm thinking of the discussion last night uh, with Hans Maruemi's uh, presentation. Um, so God's creational intent is binary, male and female, but we live in a fallen world and sometimes things don't go as they ought to. So, and there could be multiple causes of that. And, and I'll talk about that. Our Christian response then is to be one of compassion, working with these people to see how we can help them in whatever way we can. And then the third position is a diversity position where a male and female binary is descriptive rather than prescriptive. Um, and we are to actually celebrate departures from the norm. So there are different ways in looking to see how such an, a gender incongruence could develop. Um, is gender really an essentialist thing? This is what I am and I can't change what I am. Or could it be altered by uh, various situations? So I'll, I'll start with the evidence for the first one. Uh, the first thing uh, studies that people have been looking at in, in this whole trans transgender question is, well, are their brains different? And we know there are many sexually dimorphic regions in the brain. In other words, there are different sizes between males and females. What about people who are transgender? And the results from that are mixed. First of all, um, these are, are postmodern uh, brain studies. And you need to look to see whether, well, did these people take hormones before they died? Because taking the other hormone may uh, cause a change in the structures of the brain. But also you need to think about if they transitioned, the act, the actions involved in transitioning may also have affected these regions. So um, that complicates things as well. Uh, the next point is that we do know that the, from animal studies that these regions in the brain are involved in sexual behavior but is that the same as gender? We don't know that. So is anatomy really a good representation of function? And again, the question is not clear on that. And the studies that have been done looking at all these various dimorphic regions show that there isn't a typical male and a typical female brain, but there is mosaicism and overlap in these regions. So I think looking at anatomy isn't really helpful to try to sort out this issue. So the next question to look at is, is hormones. Now, just to go back to sexual development, um, males have a Y chromosome that has an SRY gene. 
uh, six weeks into gest into the development, um, that Y uh, that SRY gene is turned on, testes develop instead of ovaries, and those testes produce testosterone, and well, then the, the reproductive organs develop in the male pathway. And if you don't have the SRY gene and testosterone, then you develop into the female pathway. But that doesn't address the brain because this is early on in development. So the, the classic understanding of um, sexualization of the brain in, one, in male or female is the organization and activation model. So this was done quite some time ago in rodents, but it seems to be the case in humans as well. So the organizational uh, step occurs before birth, not early, but closer to the time of birth under the effect of testosterone. Um, it's more complicated than that, but we'll leave it at that. Um, and then the activation stage would occur at puberty as the hormone levels increase associated with, with puberty. And again, those are sexual behaviors, but we don't know if that's actually gender that would also develop at that time, but we have some clues. Um, so then sex and gender actually develop at different times. And so is it possible that um, they could develop indifferently because they happen at different times? So what might be the role of hormones and gender? Um, we've got some clues. First of all, um, diethylstilbestrol is a synthetic estrogen that some women took mainly back in the 50s um, to prevent premature labor uh, and miscarriage and things like that. Um, and there is evidence that prenatal exposure to DES uh, leads to feminization and there are cases of transgender uh, people uh, that were a result of that. Secondly, so that would be a male to a female uh, transition. Uh, the other way around, um, the adrenal gland produces these androgens, male acting hormones, in low levels in both males and females. However, this condition, CAH, causes an overproduction of those androgens, and that can lead to masculinization of, uh, of a female brain. A um, third study looked at androgen ins insensitivity. So these are people who are genetically male, they have testes, produce testosterone, but do not respond to it. The receptors are defective. Now they could be completely defective or partially defective. And in this study, they looked at gender identity in these people and all of them with complete insensitivity uh, identified as female. That's not surprising, they are physically female. Um, however, what was surprising is most of the people who had partial insensitivity, even though their bodies looked female, they identified as males, suggesting that even a low level of testosterone exposure could cause um, a gender um, identification as male. And this is a very recent study looking at um, genetic variants in transgender individuals, and a number of them found gene variants that affect estrogen signaling pathways. So hormones in some way seem to be involved in gender identity. Uh, here's someone I know personally, Greg Eilers. He was a, uh, he's a retired Lutheran, Missouri Synod, very conservative church, uh, he was a pastor. He had lifelong gender dysphoria. Although he doesn't have proof for it, he thinks it's because his mother took DES before he was born. Um, she died before he could ask her about that. Um, and he, despite uh, trying to get counseling and doing all kinds of things, he had to resign from the ministry and he transitioned to Gina. So you can see the picture on the top right. And this transition involved surgeries, hormones, and things like that. And what he found over time was taking testosterone blockers and estrogen that resolved the dysphoria so that he no longer felt like a woman. And so he thought, great. So he went off those hormones and then immediately flipped back to the dysphoria. So he transitioned back to male, but he needs to remain on testosterone blockers and estrogen in order to feel male. I don't understand that. He doesn't understand that, but it works for him. So that's kind of biological basis for gender. Now, studies on gender incongruence have found that these are the early onset ones. Most of them actually desist. Um, depending on the study, it's 60 to 90% of them. But in most cases, these children, um, although they have it earlier on, it resolves when they reach puberty. But then the question is, well, how do we know which ones are real? And so they, the criteria are called persistent, insistent, and consistent. And, and then they say, well, these people, they probably really are uh, in gender incongruence, and then we might need to treat them with hormones.
And if you're not sure, one of the approaches is to give them puberty blockers because that'll give them more time and they can figure out which one they really are. Unfortunately, when you give these children puberty blockers, none of the cases desist and everyone stays with the incongruence. Uh, and so you're very virtually guaranteeing that they're going to uh, want to transition. The other thing is, um, if you have to give them puberty blockers, you are actually missing an important developmental stage where your bone mass increases. So you're not really just delaying puberty, you're actually missing some physiological steps in there. There are other issues with puberty blockers as well, um, but these are being recommended by many uh, clinicians. Okay, other concerns I have. First of all, the criteria to measure gender dysphoria um, they are of poor quality. And so there really isn't an objective way to measure whether someone has gender dysphoria or incongruence. And a lot of that is because we're entirely dependent on self-diagnosis. Um, and so how can we really prove what's going on there? Um, this, the book that I mentioned by Yarhouse and Sadusky, they describe a, a looping effect where someone classifies a condition, in this case, gender incongruence, and then people who are not sure about what's going on in their brain, they see that and then they say, oh, that must be what I have. And then what happens is an industry starts to develop where you get institutions arising, you get more people uh, jumping on, I shouldn't say bandwagon, but because there are legitimate cases of this. Um, but then the condition is, is basically taken for granted. And so you have this self um, perpetuating um, industry that's going on and are we really critically looking at uh, what's going on? Um, now, the other question is uh, um, misdiagnosis. Now, I'm, I'm glad I spoke after a talk uh, on, on autism because there's a very high rate of autism in gender incongruence. So is what's going on in that case. Um, the other concern I have is gender counseling is gen generally an affirmative approach. You do gender affirmation. I see those words paired together quite a lot in the literature. And, um, and that's a bit worrisome because what if they really don't have that? And so the idea of, of trying to get them to change is, is, is really frowned upon. Um, might there be a confusion between same-sex attraction and a gender incongruence? and they are not the same thing. One is outwardly focused and the other one's inwardly focused, um, but that may be the case as well. Um, you may have heard of Lisa Littman's uh, article came out a few years ago, but the idea of social contagion. So that before the, this is the adult or the adolescent onset, um, these people are on the internet a lot. Um, there, there are tons of YouTube videos about transitioning and, and she's wondering how much does your social context I encourage you to transition and, and think you actually have it when you don't. Um, and the last one is um, Stephen Gliske's multi-sense model. And I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail, but what he's proposing is that instead of looking at brain anatomy, we look at brain networks. We've got pathways inside the, in the brain that do different things. And he's proposing that alterations in distress, social, behavioral, and body ownership networks, those alterations could lead to an alteration in your sense of gender. Now, he just put this out as a proposal, uh, and it was published, uh, but there was a furious backlash against this paper. Uh, eventually, the journal retracted it, although you can still find it, you can still read it. Um, but that also brings into um, the whole political situation that's going on there as well. So. Um, the short answer is we really don't know what's going on in, in, in gender incongruence, but I suspect that many cases are not legitimate cases, but there are some that are real. Um, further on, do other things compound the problem? Does our culture say, well, if you're male, you should be this way, and if you're female, you should be that way, and what about people who don't fit the stereotypes? Do they feel ostracized and maybe the wrong gender? Even our uh, evangelical culture uh, has not done a, a good job in that, in, in promoting male and female gender roles. And if you've read Kristen Kovitz Dumais book, um, you can see what we're talking about. And if you read Proverbs 31, the wife of Proverbs 31 does not fit that stereotype either. Um, earlier on, I mentioned that a lot of adolescent girls want to transition. And I think it's really difficult to be an adolescent girl these days because of misogyny, sexual harassment, and other inequalities that they face. And if they're having issues, they might think, well, maybe just being a boy or I should have been a boy. And, and uh, that might get a 
get things better. So last slide here, what can we as Christians do? First of all, we should recognize people, these people are in our society and they're in our churches and we need to acknowledge that. Uh, regardless of whether it's a, um, a misdiagnosis or something gen genuine, we need to acknowledge that. They are very stressed. Suicidal ideation is like 40% both before and after transitioning. Transitioning does not make them feel better uh, even though there's a temporary high. We need to think about what we say and what we act and how that impacts them um, because we can be a barrier to the gospel to these people. So we need to engage them in some way. The question is, is how and, and not by telling them that what they're doing is, is wrong and, and whatever. Uh, we cannot reach them if we do not show love for them. So that's it. And then I just have some references and I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you, Tony. We have time for uh, a few questions. So um, I really appreciate you talking about reaching out in love. I think your house kind of lands that way that we're all working to become more like the image of Christ. And mm -hmm. so they have something to tell us as well as we have something to tell them. And I really want to be in a position where we're all working together in the body of Christ to become more like Christ than us fix them or them try to fix us or whatever. I think I kind right. of put more of a diversity to it. Um, I like that you talked about body ownership. I can't remember the person's name, but um, Nancy Piercy has a book called Love Thy Body. And it really does talk about how if you go after the body and what the body, you're saying that the mind is more important than the body when you get in these situations for transgender. And so now you get into this dichotomy, what's more important, the mind or the body? And do we value the body or not? But her book, Nancy Piercy, Love Thy Body, I think is really important in trying to kind of go through that a little bit. Any comments about where you land with the body and the mind? No, I, I agree. I think Nancy Piercy makes a good point. There's a book I'm reading right now by Carl Truman. It's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And he's talking about how in history, um, you know, he's, he's basically saying, how can the thought of being you know, in the wrong body, how can people actually think that way? And he's doing historical uh, development, I'm only halfway through the book, but, but basically saying the same thing is like, what we feel that is really who we are and our body isn't. And I think Nancy Pierce is saying the same thing. So I agree with that. Okay, hey, Lynn, short question. Yeah, a short comment, actually. I just wanted to applaud you bringing this out in a public forum, in a Christian group, and dealing with the whole issue with a sense of love. I'm dealing with it with several grandchildren right now. So I do appreciate your comments, and thank you. All right, thank you. It's a bit nerve-wracking, yes, but... <laughs> Yeah, so my question, uh, Tony, is um, what about environmental um, uh, influences like uh, you know, hormones and um, you know, plastic and uh, other kinds of uh, hormonal pollution? Do you think that's having an effect on the reason why we're having this You seem to be cutting in and out. Are you, you were talking about hormones. Is this um, before birth or afterward? Well, uh, just generally, like in the water we drink and so on, is that you think that might be having an effect? I'm sorry, I still didn't hear the question clearly. So maybe it's it like maybe it's on my side. About environmental, like plastic yeah. and those kinds of things. Oh, plastic. Okay, um, that could be. I just question how much those levels are. So we, then we need to distinguish gender from just sexual function in general. And, and we do know that those environmental estrogens do that. It's, it's just the whole notion of what causes gender is, it seems to be so fuzzy. Hormones do seem to be involved in it in some way, but exactly how is not clear. So the best I can say is possibly. A question from Lydia Jager. Yeah, thank you for addressing this, uh, this question. I think it's, it's a very important one. Would you consider that there are situations or say persons uh, where a gender transition should be recommended? We're, we're a transition. Yes. Yes, I would. Uh, I think if, if there is a legitimate biological case, so in the case of Greg Eilers, um, he and I have been communicating back and forth. I haven't met him, but um, you could read his book. It's, it's fascinating. Um, he just said, I'll have to transition or I will kill myself. And 
And he said, I just cannot live as a man. It started out with cross-dressing in, in secret. He's married and his wife stuck with him through all this. Um, but he said, I realize I am a man but I cannot live as a man. I have to live as a woman. So he sees the distinction between sex and gender, and he realizes his sex is male, regardless of how he lives. And so I, I would support him in that situation simply because um, he says, that's the only way I, I could survive. Now, thankfully, graciously, God was gracious to him that he figured out a way that to, to get rid of that, but that worked for him, but not for other people. So I think there are legitimate cases of, of gender incongruence or gender dysphoria, and, and then we as Christians need to help them work through that. But the other concern I have is uh, when these are not legitimate cases, um, then you're subjecting to people for um, take, taking hormones and disfiguring surgery for the rest of their lives. And if, and if that's for the wrong reason, then that really scares me but i think there are legitimate cases yes we're going to move on to our last speaker